So let's go through the names of the individuals who may be involved in cases. Um, we have a couple of pages on this. Number one, the plaintiff is the person who brings the civil action in court. Um, and they, they're the ones that say, you know, I believe that this that the law was broken um, and I'm, I'm here to complain about it. The defendant is the person against whom a case is brought. And so typically the plaintiff is complaining about something that the defendant did and they're charging them with a civil, civil, civil violation. The appellant is a person who brings an appeal. Now, let's say we go through the court hearing and the court rules for the plaintiff. The defendant can say, you know what, I want to appeal this decision because I think you missed this area of the law that is relevant. And so the the appeal goes up to the appellate court. The appellant is the one bringing the appeal. It's not it could be the plaintiff or it could be the defendant. Um, and the appellee is the person against whom the appeal is brought. So these roles could differ, right? You could say, well, rule for the plaintiff originally, but then if it goes up to appeal by the defendant, the defendant then might now become the um, the appellant. Um, and they're the one that says, no, no, you know, this is wrong. This is a wrong interpretation. Um, and then the, the role gets shifted and the plaintiff is now the appellee. Petitioner is the one who appeals a course to the Supreme Court. So you can petition the Supreme Court to hear a case um, if you believe that you that the rulings were wrong and you've gone through lower level courts, you've gone through appeals courts and you're still not feeling like the course, the case has been addressed as it needs to be. You can petition something to appear to appear in front of the Supreme Court. The respondent is the one um, against whom a case is appealed at the Supreme Court level. So, you know, so your plaintiff and defendant is at your court level, the appellant and appellee are at the appeals level, and then the petitioner and respondent are at the Supreme Court level. Additional terminology that you need to be aware of. Number one, the law reporter. That's basically the book in which the court opinions are placed. Um, and so part of the citations, as I already told you, includes what volume of the law reporter it is, whether it's a Supreme Court reporter or a federal court reporter or a supplemental reporter, whatever that might be. Um, and you use that to figure out where the case is available and where it's located. The case citation includes the volume, the pages in the specific law reporter where the opinion is found. A motion to dismiss means the defendant is requesting that the court reject the plaintiff's case for because there's a defect, um, whether they can say, you know, whether it's there's no prima facie case or they didn't meet the, the minimum criteria to be eligible for a lawsuit could be, you know, whatever um, criteria that might be. A motion for summary judgment is the defendant requests the court to rule on the case based on documents submitted so that they uh, I'm saying that there's nothing really trialable um, that needs to be done because here's all the information and that we don't really we need the courts to just rule that this is just not relevant and we can just go forward and do whatever we need to do to get this concluded. A per curiam means there's a brief determination made by an appellate court that's not issued by a particular judge. Um, so the judge, uh, the, the appellate court, uh, makes a determination about the brief. So you hear the term prima facie case often in when we talk about civil rights laws um, and the civil rights legislation. So... We start with a cause of action. A right is provided by the law for a party to sue for remedies when certain legal rights are violated. So let's say I was sexually harassed by my boss and I am filing charges. My cause of action is that I was sexually harassed by my boss and it's violated my legal rights by being subjected to sexual harassment. So your prima facie case is the presentation of the evidence that fits the requirements whether or not there's there's just cause to act. So, uh, for example, a prima facie case for sexual harassment has to do with notice and, um, uh, and, and other factors that have to be in place, whether or not it meets those minimum criteria. Then we can also talk about a prima facie case for um, uh, disparate treatment. Prima facie case for disparate treatment basically means that we've met all the criteria that says there's a possibility 
that that something wrong occurred. And so the prima facie case for disparate treatment is we the person is is um, um, qualified to do the job. They applied for the job. They didn't get the job. And there is no good reason, you know, sort of good, any good reason justifying why the job should still be open if the person is highly qualified now. There could be all sorts of reasons why that job might still be open. There may be factors that didn't show up, you know, that the person isn't aware of, bad reference, all sorts of things that could pop up. But what has to happen is that the plaintiff has to say, look, I I applied for the job. I was qualified for the job based on the criteria. I was interviewed and I didn't even get a call back or I didn't even get an interview or anything like that. So I've met the standards for whether or not the courts should look at this to have a cause of action. Um, and, and then the court can, you know, the courts can decide whether or not there is adequate information there. Um, and it, then it requires the defendant to appear and to rebut the claims. And that's how you get your court case, right? The, the plaintiff makes the complaint. The defendant defends themselves and says, no, no, that's not what happened. This is actually what happened. And, and then the, then the court has to decide, you know, who's right and who's wrong in, the, in that circumstance. At will employment means that the employer and the employee have no contractual obligation to each other to remain in the relationship. And so it is a reciprocal relationship, meaning that the employer can let the employee go for any reason or no reason or good reason or bad. And the employee can also leave of their own free will for good reason, bad reason, no reason. We're under no obligation in an at will relationship, employment relationship to, um, to give notice if we don't want to. Um, it's courtesy to do that, but under, under, under an at will, you're, you're not obligated to do that. Now, this um, origin of at-will employment came under the English feudal system, right, where we had the master, um, the person who um, managed the, the territory, right, and the serf that worked for them. And that serf um, could kind of come and go as long as they wished to work. Um, and the um, the employer could uh, would keep them or not keep them, and the person could be free to go and move about their, their business as they want to. Um, there are some exceptions, which we'll talk about in a few moments, but it is important to recognize that um, those exceptions are very narrow, and in employment at will, if you're in an at will situation and you do something that's not protected, you, you have very little room uh, to argue. And, and a great example of where at will employment um, had a huge impact was um, with Waco Corporation in Michigan when they were firing employees who were smokers and they gave them ample opportunities to try to quit to smoke. They paid, they paid for them to engage in smoking cessation programs. And in the end, they let the people go when they didn't quit. And the company, the, the, the employees, the former employees complained that the, the employer should never have let them go and it was inappropriate. And the courts ruled that they were at will employees and that being a smoker is not a protected class. And so given that it didn't matter whether or not you liked it, the bottom line is the employer got to make the, the policy and they made, they made the rule. They gave people ample time to quit. People didn't quit. And so they were let go. And so, um, at will, you know, can be applied appropriately um, as long as we're not violating, you know, certain laws and, and rules and, and policies, which we'll talk about in a moment. So who's excluded from at will employment? Number one, government employees. Government employees are not considered at will. Um, you cannot be let go uh, unless there's just cause behind that. Um, employees that have a collective bargaining agreement, same sort of situation, unionized workers covered under a collective bargaining agreement are not considered at will. The contract, the collective bargaining agreement, has precedent um, over any at will arrangements that may exist at the state level. So if you're a unionized employee with a collective bargaining agreement, there's very clear rules for when you can be let go and when you are not allowed to be let go. Individuals who have an individual contract with an employer um, that 
spells out when they can or cannot be let go. Um, and typically we see these types of contracts with upper level employees, higher level executives who have a negotiated contract that's very specific and unique to them. It's not usually sort of a uniform uh, contract that applies to multiple people. It limits the employer's discretion to just cause to ter uh, terminations and it defines the duration of employment, you know, and so if I have, I, I was laid off of a company a number of years ago and the company had a policy for how much severance they were going to give to people and things like that. And one of the individuals said, oh no, I have an employee contract. I have an individual contract with you, which has very clear guidelines about how much I'm supposed to get paid, what my exit costs will be, um, you know, and whether or not, you know, I will get unemployment or how much I'll get in severance and all those sort of factors. So his contract sort of trumped everything else that, you know, was out there in terms of the policies that the company wanted to have. And then lastly, damages for uh, wrongful termination or unjust dismissal um, is important for you to think about because if you are um, if you are um, engaging in um, uh, un, uh, a wrongful termination or an un unjust dismissal of somebody, there's compensatory damages, which is I, I compensate you for the time you were off work. But there also could be punitive damages, which 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 take the costs and go above and beyond. And what the intention behind punitive damages is to punish the wrongdoer. And typically, punitive damages happen when someone has been warned time and time again not to do something, and so the courts basically hit them in their pocketbook, which is the, sometimes the only way that or corporations are going to understand and, and make changes is when you hit them where it hurts the most, which is in their pocketbook. So so it, it, we can recall the case where the woman uh, drank the coffee um, at McDonald's and she put the cup uh, of hot coffee in between her legs and the coffee spilled and she had, um, you know, second degree burns um, and I think maybe even to some extent third degree burns on her leg because the fluid got caught inside her nylon stockings and, and it created a, a horrible situation where the um, um, the the liquid was was captured against her skin and it burned longer than anticipated. And so she got compensatory damages and that's all she really wanted was to have McDonald's pay for her damages and to pay for her case. And she didn't look for more, but she got these punitive damages because it came out that McDonald's had been warned on multiple occasions that their coffee exceeded the temperature that was allowed um, and that it was a hazard, particularly for people coming through a drive through um, and then trying to juggle, you know, stuff in a car. And so they were told to bring the temperature down on their coffee and they didn't do it. And so because of that, that's why the, the, the punitive damages for her case were, were much higher than what she was really asking for. Um, and so it's important to, to recognize that. So what are some additional exceptions to at-will employment? Public policy is a big one. And what it mean, what this means is states have a very wide uh, berth regarding recognition of exceptions. Um, and some states uh, allow exceptions in some areas, but not others. But basically, public policy essentially means uh, it's intended to ensure that no one is permitted to act in a way that may injure the public or damage the public good. And a good example of this is whistleblowing, right? A whistleblower, the purpose of the whistleblower is to amplify when someone has been injured or that an organization's behaviors may injure the general public. So the whistleblower who um, who uh, blew the whistle on Enron, right? Um, they could have been fired, and maybe they were fired, I don't remember, recall, but there was somebody who blew the whistle on Enron, um, and that had a huge impact. That person could not or should not have been fired under the at-will laws simply because they were doing something to help the public good. Um, and so if someone gets fired, it, that doesn't mean that they won't get fired. It just means that they're really not allowed to be fired. And so if somebody's fired and it's found to be in violation of public policy, um, then they have remedies in court in order to be able to 
uh, win their case in court. Um, so there are various federal and state acts and provisions regarding how do we protect whistleblowers and other public policy types of um, um, exemptions uh, to at-will employment. Other at-will exceptions are things like retaliatory discharge. And retaliatory discharge is when an employee is exercising their right to do a certain behavior. For example, filing a claim of sexual harassment or, for example, uh, trying to join a union or organize a union. You can't fire somebody for doing something that is considered to be legally protected. Um, and and they, exam they have a good example of the case Harawi versus um, Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences. And you can read that case in your textbook, no problem. So um, constitutional protections um, are also um, uh, important under retaliatory discharge. We are constitutionally protected um, with certain behaviors that we can engage in uh, based on federal law and, and based on state and local laws. And so when those are violated, then that is what we consider to be a uh, retaliatory discharge if someone is then fired for engaging in legitimate constitutionally protected activities. And again, what is protected in at the state level obviously varies from state to state because we know state laws are going to differ. Some state laws are, have protect people for, for example, for LGBT um, identities and in the workplace and in employment and things like that. And other um, uh, states do not protect people at the state level. So, um, it, so if you're in a state where you're protected at the state level and somebody discriminates against you, then that would be a constitutionally protected activity uh, in that in that context. And this is just a very interesting graphic from the EEOC and in the found in your textbook uh, exhibit 2.4 that shows you the process, right? The individual, the employee engages in a protected activity, then an adverse employment action occurs, they get fired or they get demoted, um, and then there has to be a causal connection between the protected activity and the adverse action, which is obviously part of the data that 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 and that and the the, the fact finding that happens during the case. Um, so if you can show that there is a causal connection between the two in terms of making that prima facie case for retaliatory discharge, then um, that's uh, that that the next step is then it goes to court. 